So good morning. This morning we're going to talk about housing. Um, as we all travel around the state, that's the number one concern we hear almost everywhere. Housing is an issue in Colorado. So this morning we're going to have several different presenters. I would like to introduce to you, first of all, Virgil Turner. Virgil is a 30-year employee for City of Montrose and is now serving and has since 2012 as a director of innovation and citizen engagement. The only way I can remember that is to say he's the one who rolls the dice. Okay, so dice, director of innovation and citizen engagement. Virgil works to drive innovation and improve the value proposition in the provision of public services to citizens and to make Montrose a place where current and future generations can thrive. Initiatives which Virgil is actively working on include broadband, shared services, active transportation, active item public places, and housing. Our first speaker will be Susan Barrientos. Susan's such a delightful young lady. She's just as nice now as she was when she was a fifth grader. <laughs> Can you guess who her teacher was in fifth grade? So Susan grew up in Olathe. She graduated from Western State College with a double major in accounting and business administration. She started with Montrose County Housing five years ago as the finance director and became the executive director about three years ago. So please, welcome Susan Barrientos. Thank you. So as Mrs. Files said, I'm Susan Barrientos, the Executive Director of the Montrose County Housing Authority. We came this morning just to give you a little bit of insight about who we are and what we do. First, I would like to introduce my co-workers. I didn't tell them I was going to do this, but Diane Pacheco. Diane's been with the Housing Authority for 13 years. She's our property manager. Diane and our two part-time maintenance people keep all of our properties in ship shape. Summer is our new manager of our Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. Summer's been with the Housing Authority for about five years. We have one other employee, and that's Rose. Rose has been with us for about three years. We left her man in the office this morning. Rose spends about half of her day being our finance director, and the other half of the day helping Summer with the voucher program. I would also like to acknowledge my predecessor, Tim Hebers. Tim was the executive director of the Housing Authority for 18 years. I will introduce my board, but I'd like to wait for just a few minutes to do that. So the Montrose Housing Authority was organized in 1980 to provide rental assistance to low and very low income families, elderly, and disabled individuals. It works, Virgil. So the programs that we administer are the Section 8 voucher program, we have farm labor housing, multifamily housing, which is just another name for any age. They do have to be 18 or over. Um, and then we have elderly and disabled housing. We are not part of Montrose County, the governmental entity. Most of the people we serve are in Montrose County. However, with our federal vouchers, we can serve Montrose and Uray counties. With our state vouchers, we can actually serve Montrose, Uray, and Delta counties. We are a quasi-governmental organization. That basically means that we're funded by the government but privately managed. We are a nonprofit with 501c3 status. And now my board. We have a five-member board of directors. Three of those members are citizens from each of the county commissioner districts. Uh, our our uh, board member from District 1 is actually our board chair. He's Tony Morales. Our person from District 2 is Carol Whitberg. From District 3, someone most of you probably know, Christine Peake. In addition then to those three, we have a city representative on our board of directors, and that's our vice chair, Virgil Turner. And we have a county representative, and that is Commissioner Sue Hansen. And I saw Sue here somewhere. There she is, way back there. I would also like to acknowledge Tom Marshner. Tom is our past board chair. All of these uh, 
people are appointed by the board of directors, I'm sorry, by the county commissioners, and they serve a five-year term. So we'll talk about the voucher program. This was set up by HUD, the Office of Housing and Urban Development, to help low and very low income people pay their rent. These, these vouchers are called housing choice vouchers. We give the voucher to the participant and they get to choose where they live. So they go out and find a rental. Uh, we make them stay for one year. And then after that, they can move to a different rental and take their voucher with them, whether that's within our jurisdiction or outside, uh, we call that porting. We just had a lady last week port to California. So they can port anywhere in the U.S. or our territories that has a housing authority. Um, and these participants, you're going to hear me say this many times today, these participants pay 30% of their income toward rent. So we'll look at the income limits. For one person, they can make $23,600 or less and qualify for our program. For two people, $26,900. For three people, a little over $30,000. And for four people, a little over $33,500. So the way it works is the, the people come in, they get an application, they can also find that on our website. And I like to explain it as they bring their application in and they go into this pool. If we deem that they have a preference, and I'll get to what gives them a preference in just a minute, once they get a preference, then they move up the wait list. Uh, they, the wait list is determined, first they must have a preference, and then to, by the time and date. So it's basically first come, first serve. Uh, typically, our wait list is about 24 months long, two years. We're actually guesstimating that it's a little bit longer than that. And at that point, HUD recommends that you close the wait list. So at this time, our Section 8 voucher wait list is closed. We are not accepting applications. So I talked about a preference. What could be happening in someone's life that would give them a preference? If they're homeless, that gives them a preference. If they're a victim of violence or natural disaster, that would give them a preference. If the head of household is elderly or disabled, they get a preference. And our final preference is working towards self-sufficiency. This either means having a job or education after high school, whether that's college or a trade school, that would also give them a preference. So our voucher funding. Pretty simple. Our, our federal funding comes again from HUD, the Office of Housing and Urban Development. The first day of every month, HUD puts a set amount into our bank account. They base that on our last five or six months of spending. So the money goes into our bank account and we write those checks out to our landlords directly. For the state of Colorado, they do things a little bit differently. Summer uploads all of the tenant information and the landlord information to the state system, and the state pays those landlords directly. Uh, we are allotted 178 regular vouchers and 14 VASH vouchers, or veterans vouchers, for homeless vets. Um, we, for both of those programs, we're allowed to spend about $85,000 a month. Currently, we're housing 172 households and 11 veterans. So our VASH vouchers, we awarded these. Um, Tim Hebers, there was a grassroots at the Warrior Center, a lot of lobbying for this, and we were uh, awarded 14 of these in 2014. Um, I, the VA and HUD got together and decided that this would be a good program to give these homeless vets housing, intensive case management, and clinical services all in one. So we'll talk about our Colorado Division of Housing vouchers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they have several different types of vouchers. We administer about 85 of these. So the first one that they administer is a home ownership program. And just as the name suggests, instead of the state of Colorado paying the landlord, they pay the bank or the mortgage company for a portion of the participant's mortgage. We administer two of these. Supportive housing vouchers. These serve families with disabilities, 
mental illness, or substance abuse disorders. And we administer eight of these. So the way these work is they have a caseworker. The caseworker works with the participant to apply to the state of Colorado. Then once they reach the top of the state of Colorado list, they will email or call Summer and say, this person and their caseworker typically will be in and Summer will go through the intake process and issue that voucher. Um, Colorado Choice transition, transition Voucher, if any of you know Eva Veach, this is her pet right here. Eva loves these vouchers, she works with people um, coming out of nursing homes and that's, uh, these are for people coming out of nursing homes or institutions, a halfway house, a drug institution, uh, drug rehab, a uh, mental health institution. These provide then permanent housing for these people. At this time, we only administer one of these. The Homeless Solution Program, we administer two of these. These are targeted toward Coloradans experiencing homelessness. They do give a preference for people with special needs for this program, and we administer two of these. Okay, then we've teamed up with our friends here at CASA. For the first time ever, we are doing project-based vouchers. And as the name suggests, the vouchers stay at the project. So we administer 12 vouchers for CASA at their first place on 2nd Street. So the voucher's in the unit, the tenant moves in and uses the voucher, the tenant moves out, but the voucher stays and is there for the next tenant. Um, this is, is a good warm up. We will also be administering federal vouchers. Colorado Outdoors was just awarded tax credits for a tax credit property and we will administer eight project based vouchers for that program. And I think Virgil will chat with you a little more about that. So let's say you've come in, you've put in the application, we've said you have a preference, and you've moved up to the top of our list. We're under our $85,000 a month spending, so we say, well, we, we'll, we'll issue some more vouchers. So at that point, Summer sends out what we call a come on down letter. Tells them, we send eight or ten, tells them come on in and get a voucher. Um, typically, six or eight will come back. Five, six, eight, is that about right, Summer? We'll come in, Summer does a group intake. She gives them each a binder about this thick, goes through a PowerPoint that matches all the information in their binder. It takes her about two hours, and it tells them the do's, the don'ts, the rules, the, what we need to, them to follow through with, um, what they need their landlord to do, what we agreed with their landlord to do, and what they can expect from us. Um, once they've gone through the intake, then Summer issues them a voucher, a bedroom size voucher, a one bedroom, a two bedroom. The general HUD rule is two heartbeats per bedroom, but if it were me and my 10 year old grandson as a household, Summer would give us a two bedroom voucher. So there is some room for some common sense there as well. Alright, so I've got my voucher. Now I need, I need to go out into the community. I need to find a landlord that will accept HUD uh, because they don't have to at this point. I think there's talk in Washington, D.C. to try to change that. But at this point, they don't have to accept HUD. Um, and and I have, a, I have a, a payment standard. So if my grandson and I have a two-bedroom, we need to find a place for a little under $900. You can see the one bedroom is a little under 700, three bedroom 1224, four bedroom 1315, five bedroom 1512. So I got online to see what, what I could find. I found a one bedroom for 900, I found another one bedroom for 925. I looked at two bedrooms, I found one for 995 and one for 1100. So you can see where I'm going with this. Um, this this amount, this number, is the total amount that can be paid by the tenant and HUD together. We've had people ask, well, if I can't find can I, a place for, for that much, can I pay the extra? And the answer is absolutely not. HUD feels like if they can afford to pay the extra, they don't need HUD's help. So, uh, so how do they find a place? Well, obviously, they're not going to find, they're not going to be renting on high-end rentals. Um, but I've heard Summer very encouragingly say 
You can find a place, you have to work really hard to do it. Um, we give them the names of, of anybody that, that has called in. We have to be very careful because these are housing choice vouchers. We have to be careful to not help them find a place or HUD calls that steering. We have to be careful not to steer somebody. But we do give them the information for the property managers here in town or if someone's called in and said, I have a three bedroom, we give them that information. These vouchers are issued for 120 days. If the participant doesn't find a place in 120 days, the voucher expires. They will have to then wait until our wait list opens so they can put in another application and move back up the list. So we, you know, we really try to stress the importance. This, this voucher is, is very valuable and you need, to, you need to work hard. And most of them do find rentals. About three years ago, they were having a really tough time and my board decided that maybe we should purchase some rentals. So we've purchased a few each year. We now own five individual homes and a duplex. So we have seven rentals that we rent to our voucher participants at these payment standards. We'll move on to farm labor housing because Montrose County is an agricultural community. Special assistance is given to citizens um, and permanent residents, these are the people that I know of as having a green card, who work in the farming industry. So in 1993, 12 duplexes were built scattered throughout Olathe. So we have 24 three and four bedroom family homes for our farm workers. To qualify for this program, 65% of their income must come from farm labor. These are subsidized by USDA Rural Development, and the subsidy stays with the unit. And I'll repeat myself here, 30% of their income must be paid toward rent. There's a picture. So let's look at these income limits. And I'm going to steal my sheet, cheat sheet from the voucher program. So let's just go for the three-person household, it's 287. For a three-person for summer's program, it was 30,300. So all of these are about $1,500 within the same uh, limits as the voucher program. So very similar income limits. Um, then our Barber Court Apartments, which as I said, uh, are multifamily. We have 24 units here in Montrose. Barber Court, as the name suggests. Um, 18 of these units are subsidized. Again, through USDA Rural Development, the subsidy does stay with the unit. And again, 30% of the, their income must go toward rent. So the other six units then are offered at what, at what Rural Development deems as the market rate for our property. And that is $489 a month. So you can remember when I said I was for a place, I found one for 900 and one for 950. So it seems like a stellar deal. However, we had one vacate about a year ago, and Diane went passed up 12 people on her Barber Court wait list. That 489 was much more than a third of their income. They could not afford that. So the, she did find, she does keep them full, and she did find someone. It's just much tougher um, for, for our very low and very low income. We had a lady come in yesterday who makes twice that. She wanted to live at Barber Court, and we said, well, if, if we have one that's not subsidized, you know, can you afford that? And she said, no, that would be half of my income. There's a picture of those. We have uh, four buildings at Barber Court with six units in each building. And again, because this is USDA Rural Development, the income limits are the same as they were for the farm labor. Okay, and we'll talk about our Olathe Meadows property. This is for very low income seniors and disabled. We have 24 one bedroom units uh, next door to our office in Olathe. It's also across the street from the community center where they serve senior lunches three days a week. Um, these people must be 62 or older, or if they're disabled, they must still be 55 or older to live at this property. Again, the subsidy stays with the property. These are subsidized by HUD through CHAFA, the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority. Um, and again, 
the participants have to pay 30% of their income toward rent. There's a picture of those. There we have uh, six buildings with four units in each building. This complex also has a community center with two sets of coin-operated washer and dryers so they can do their laundry on site. It also has a full kitchen so they do potlucks and birthday parties, those type of things. Okay, let's talk about these income limits though. So for one person it was $22,000 or $23,000 for the other two programs. For, for this program it's $12,500. So these people are typically our seniors that are living on $1,000 a month or less Social Security. Um, the Housing Authority used to run a daycare. Um, when that ended, we used the building and we now rent it to the Black Canyon Boys and Girls Club. Next door to the Black Canyon Boys and Girls Club was a vacant lot 25 or 30 years ago, Tim. It was rented to the uh, Migrant Head Start program. They brought their buildings in and so they run that in the summer. So just to wrap up, get my little cheat sheet here so I don't have to turn around. Let's look at, at, at what we, who we helped and, and what we paid for the month of May. For our federal vouchers, I told you there were 172 of those, just over $83,000. Our VASH vouchers, we, we had 11 of those for $5,600. We had 71 state vouchers that cost us a little under $34,000. The home ownership program for the two of those, a little over $1,000. For our friends here at CASA, they've, we've issued all 12 of those vouchers, a little over $6,000. And then all three of our properties, Barber Court, Farm Labor, and Olathe Meadows are all full. And that was to the tune of about $4,6300 and $6,600. So for the month of May, we helped 340 households in the community to the tune of just under $147,000. That's all I have. I will turn the microphone over to Virgil. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, showing up. It's always great to, uh, to know that uh, uh, we will have a good crowd at uh, the forum. Um, I want to uh, start off, I'll uh, finish up uh, the city's presentation, but I'd like to introduce Savannah Haney. Savannah is an AmeriCorps VISTA uh, member. Uh, she has been spending a year of service in Montrose. Um, Savannah is our first AmeriCorps VISTA that, in my recollection, that has worked directly with the city. She's doing indirect service, which means she's here helping the city to increase its capacity, and helping our community to increase capacity for leadership, and uh, she's doing a fantastic job. I'm going to let her talk a little bit about what she's doing. But uh, this program is a, uh, the first year, Savannah's finishing up the first of three years uh, in this program that we're working with uh, AmeriCorps VISTA. And really excited about this debut year and we think that uh, this is a great program to help our community and I'm gonna let Savannah talk a little bit about herself. Hi, so I'm Savannah. Um, a little bit about my background. I went to Texas A&M University. I am from Texas. And I got my undergrad and my master's there. My master's is in land and property development. And after I graduated, I was looking for something and stumbled across AmeriCorps in Montrose. And it turns out that I found a really good job. Um, I only have about a month left. But I've been working on, like you said, capacity within neighborhoods, but also looking at the housing, what do we have, what do we need, just a general, like, get the numbers to what everybody feels and thinks about housing. So the median sales price has been, of homes has been going up. It's been going up nationally, statewide, within Montrose, which I feel like most people have recognized. <coughs> So 
So the first one was of the single family homes. This is of townhomes, condos, duplexes, kind of anything that isn't single family. So this is the home price to income ratio, which basically means that you pay, you're supposed to pay about two and a half times your income on a house. What this shows is that we're nationally above that for the 2007, 2008, kind of that housing bubble time period. Um, Montrose has also been really high. However, if you look at different counties and around the state, and if you look at the state and national levels, we're not doing too terrible. Like there is a little bit of a housing issue, but not so far that we can't come back from it. Like it's still doable. So this is the Montrose where we're at. So you can see that we're almost at six times your income is what we're paying for a home. So the area median income is the $42,930, um, and that is Montreux City. And you can see kind of that 80%, 50%, 30% what that means, what income level you'd be at. Um, you can even do the math to figure out the 120 or whatever percentage that you need. <coughs> So this is, for the 30% AMI, that's how many, num the blue is how many number of households, um, and then you have your severe cost burden, mild cost burden, and not cost burden, and then how many vacant units. So you can kind of see that there is a lot of people within that that are cost burden, but there's also a number that are not. Um, so the first one was for the um, own, no, sorry, for the rental. This one's for the owned. Um, they're broken up just so you can see the rental market versus the actual buying market. <coughs> and then I will hand it back over to Virgil. Thanks, Savannah. And Savannah will be around to answer questions about those numbers. Um, I think some of her, her graphs were um, pretty telling. I uh, wanted to just go back to this. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a, a home price to income ratio that's higher than the national average for sure. And um, one of the, uh, the key factors of this, so it's, it's home price plus income. Uh, we just saw a first quarter economic newsletter come from Nathan Perry from CNU that had some good news for Delta and Montrose counties. We're seeing our income levels going up um, pretty drastically over uh, the last few months and the last year. So I think my prediction is you're going to see this peak out here and maybe start uh, leveling off a bit, maybe even coming down a little bit. Thanks, Savannah, for those slides. So uh, I wanted to uh, talk briefly about some of the things we're kind of focused on at the city related to housing. I think uh, housing has always been something that we've been involved in at the city, but I think we've kind of expanded our scope. Uh, that's by bringing Savannah in to help us understand the market a little bit more, uh, but also to help uh, look at issues, maybe it's homelessness, homelessness is a housing problem. You know, someone that is not able to afford a house for whatever reason, that's, that's a housing issue. And so one of the, uh, the, these are the three topics I'd like to talk about today. This is not all we're focusing on, but I uh, wanted to touch on each of these. I think our uh, city, city administration and city council is really tuned into the impacts of workforce housing. This is, if you characterize it in Savannah's slide on AMI, this would be 
60 to 120 percent of AMI. These are folks like uh, entry-level police officers, nurses, uh, teachers coming into our community. This is the income level that we're trying to target to make sure that we both have affordable properties for them and available properties for them. Uh, it's a two-fold pro uh, problem that we need to solve. Uh, we're seeing or we're hearing anecdotally that this is a challenge. When we have new businesses that are thinking of coming to Montrose or businesses in Montrose that are wanting to ramp up and hire more people, especially those entry-level jobs, it's challenging for them to, to find it. Um, I saw Tom Inch, our uh, planner one in the audience, uh, welcome, uh, Tom, everybody welcome Tom Inch to Montrose. He's our new planner one. And uh, he uh, came to Montrose recently uh, and probably in this, uh, this workforce housing bracket that I, that I talked about. And he was able to find a property, but it was a challenge. It wasn't really easy. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll ever see it uh, become easy, but we want to actually try to, to work on that. And, and I'll talk about some of the things that we're doing towards that. Density is another issue. Uh, density uh, of housing. If you look at uh, the density or the, the number of uh, people that live per square mile in our community, it's much lower than a lot of places. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a thing. I don't know. I'm not going to say that it's good or bad. Uh, but uh, one thing lower density creates problems around is transportation. If you're living more far flung from the city center and you need to come to and from the city center for services or employment, that adds to congestion on our roads and so forth. So I think we're thinking during our comprehensive planning process that is underway right now, uh, let's look at that, our densities and see if we're at the right levels if there are ways that we can increase those densities, especially downtown, where people can live in an area where they may not need to commute to, to get to those services or employment centers, that will take some of the pressure off our transportation system. It'll increase our nightlife or vibrancy of our downtown. So I think those are some things that the city is working on, and I'll talk about a project that, that deals with that. This is a, a, a topic that is kind of a buzz around City Hall right now, construction technologies. Um, does anyone notice we've had a wet spring? <laughs> I, I just talked to our uh, chief building official and he, I said, so how's things going with housing starts? And he says, you know, it's been kind of challenging with our con contractors this spring. Uh, just imagine you bring out your pallet of uh, building materials uh, you're trying to work off those, that pallet, all of a sudden the rain comes in, those materials get wet. What happens to wet wood when uh, it starts warming up then? It gets moldy and you can't have that. So you're spending lots more time uh, protecting those materials. You're protecting and getting your property dried in. It's, it's a big challenge. So we're seeing fewer starts this year. It's not, uh, it's not a horrible start, but we're probably just a bit off pace from last year. We think if the weather turns around, we're going to see a real bubble. Uh, but it's a challenge. And so one of the things we're talking about um, is residential properties built a residential building code that may be built in a factory. So undercover, building on a more or less an assembly line, once they're dried in, you truck them to our community and assemble them. Uh, it's not a modular home, it's not a HUD home, it's a, it's a product built to residential building code standards. Currently, our code does not allow that, uh, except in manufactured home zones. So that's something we want to talk about, talk to our city council about, and make sure that this is something we're ready for. A lot of communities are benefiting from that. Uh, it, we're not sure if we can do it, a, a contractor can do that cheaper or uh, more expensive, but we, 
if it's possible, and that will take some of the uh, sting out of our housing starts. Um, that's something we should think about. So I want to talk about a few projects. Um, this is a project, um, uh, we, we refer to it as the Vine Building. It's the busy corner uh, pharmacy or busy corner uh, building on 347 East Main. This property uh, you see is a very important uh, historic property in our community. Uh, historic preservation has become a real focus for the city of Montrose as well uh, with the adoption or um, the uh, start of our Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, so we're really focused. If you think about um, not preserving this, these buildings, uh, you wouldn't really know if you woke up in, we're in Montrose uh, versus somewhere else in the country. And so our historic fabric of Montrose is really critical to, to uh, apply some energy, apply some incentives to, to help move forward. Uh, this, this is one of our workforce housing projects. Um, when you look at downtown, you see a lot of second, store, second stories. Uh, there's been a real challenge with these second stories. They set empty a lot of the times. When this building was in, um, in the heyday of this building, uh, back in the uh, early part of the uh, 1900s, uh, these second stories were warehouses. Uh, they weren't developed, they are were big open spaces. And to get those to a point where you can actually have people living in them, it's very, very costly. Uh, a lot of times there's asbestos, uh, you need to sprinkle those properties uh, for life safety, uh, there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen, and the HVACs, many of them have recently been converted from coal heat, and so there's a lot of upgrades. So it's not a, something that to get a, a workforce housing units affordable for folks like Tomage and his family to come and be able to live in Montrose to be able to utilize those, the rents would have to be so high to pay to make these um, a market rate project that there's really not that much need for those. And so the city looked at this project when we, the developers of this came to us and said, can you help us uh, achieve your goal of workforce housing, uh, plus help us get these things um, uh, Remodeled, and so here's uh, kind of the layout: five one-bedroom units. Uh, we just took a tour of these properties. It's I'm sorry. Can you say what the rents actually turned out to be? Uh, what what? The rents actually turned out to be twelve thirty-five a month. Okay, twelve thirty. This is uh, old information. Thanks, Dave, for for letting me know that. So five one-bedroom units, downtown setting, twelve thirty-five a month. Um, and that's within that uh, workforce housing range. Um, and the total project cost is 1.35 million. So that's a huge project for downtown. That's a lot of money that local contractors are working on. Here's what uh, the city helped with. All of these incentives, actually, I uh, made a point down here, all of these were paid directly to contractors. We didn't write a check to the developers of this. This is a common way that we're incentivizing projects. Instead of providing money directly to a developer, we're providing money in equity into a building. So in this case, we help them with the asbestos assessment, or abatement, historic windows, residential area sprinkler system, and some of, this was, some of that amount is in, uh, in-kind fee abatement things like plan review and so forth. This is a uh, project that uh, I'm sure you've all seen. This is Habitat for Humanity is building this project. Uh, it's, it's been on a little bit of hiatus, started with the government shutdown and uh, access to uh, funding, but it's back on track now. They're getting ready to uh, finish these projects, this project up. Uh, this will provide um, 
ownership. These will be three new property owners that have been putting sweat equity into this project. Three townhomes downtown setting, three story, 1,500 uh, square feet per, uh, per building. So we'll have families in this neighborhood. This is actually in a neighborhood that uh, I live in. And I've seen the, uh, the effect of this project in a redevelopment or a revitalization of our small little neighborhood. Uh, properties are actually moving, uh, redeveloping, and uh, they're beautiful. Uh, if you've not been in them, uh, hopefully Habitat will have a uh, chance for you to go through those. Uh, on, uh, on this uh, triplex, uh, City uh, worked with them on uh, some uh, in-kind work to clean up the existing property. I think we had some fee abatements and so forth. Woodgate Trails, uh, you've seen uh, by South City Market, a new building going up, that's Woodgate Trails. This project started um, about a year ago, when we first heard about it, about a year ago, over uh, Christmas break, I get a call from the um, Division of Housing with uh, Department of Local Affairs uh, telling me about this project. This developer came uh, wanting to get this project done, and they had been working with them. They, um, the project was at a point where they had most of their funding, but they needed a bit of a gap fund. And when they talked to DOLA, they said, here's one program that we could con consider if you can find a government entity that will par partner with you on it. This project is going to have 50 units, one and two bedrooms, 55 plus, 30 to 60 AMI. So these are senior apartments. There are a number of handicapped accessible units. Uh, completion is due in uh, October. Um, that's probably a loose deadline, but I think uh, they're pretty well in place to make that happen. It's really a, a cool project that it's close to the Community Recreation Center and the Connect Trail. Uh, here's a little, uh, uh, let me go back to this one just a minute. So the city in partnership um, on this project, we were able to get a grant, $500,000 community development block grant from um, HUD, passed through the Division of Housing with the Department of Local Affairs. That $500,000 grant fund with no cash match from the city was then in turn uh, loaned to the developer of this project to fill that final gap of equity financing for this project. It also gives the city a uh, in to look at their annual reports on is this project continuing to fulfill the needs of our community. And so we'll have a, a, a role to play through the 40 year life of that, that project. So we're really excited about it. Um, we've heard that there are over 100 folks for the 50 units, there's over 100 that have signed a uh, interest form for this property. Uh, we'll, uh, we're on track to get to 150, which by the time these, this lease is up, that will probably provide a very quick lease up for that property. Colorado Outdoors, um, Susan mentioned this project. This is uh, a project that is being developed uh, we still have, they, the developers, Colorado Outdoors, still has a lot of steps to, to get through, but you may have read in the paper, um, the Colorado Housing Finance Authority just recently approved both non-competitive and competitive uh, uh, tax credits for this project, meaning tax credits um, reduce the amount of, of uh, taxes from the state to a developer. It's credits that can be applied directly to their tax burden. And it adds equity to a project. So if you're not having to pay those taxes, 
you can add that equity into your equity stack on a project. There's a few more steps they're going to have to get to. When you think about an um, affordable housing project, uh, the reason they're affordable is through these tax credits and pro uh, project-based vouchers, housing choice vouchers, all of these add to that gap between market rate housing and affordable housing. That's how you fill that gap and make properties available to those lower AMIs. This project, uh, I think, this is an artist rendering. I think it will be a, a project that we'll all be uh, proud of in our community. It doesn't look like what you think of affordable housing would look like. This is a project that I would be happy to have my family uh, live in. This project, um, sorry about that. It's not Four Corners development. This is done by um, Colorado Outdoors, and they're working with a group of uh, partners. Sorry that the top bullet point is incorrect. This project is 72 units, one, two, and three bedroom. It's in any age, um, but it is a 30 to 80 percent AMI. Uh, it, these, this project uses income averaging, uh, which means that all of the units combined have to average to 60 AMI. Uh, we're not sure when it's going to start, uh, but it will probably be about an 18 to 2 year uh, construction cycle. And it is uh, really conveniently placed next to our Connect Trail that's uh, being installed right now. The uh, project, the way the city is uh, envisioned possibly working with them is through um, the URA that is in place, Colorado Outdoors, is an urban renewal authority. This is outside of the current phase one project, which you've seen the roads and infrastructure have been built. This project will just be to the south of that. Uh, they have not come to the city yet with a request or the URA with a request to expand uh, utilities to this site that we're they're starting to put their numbers together and see what that may look like. A URA is funded up front. The infrastructure costs are funded up front with public dollars, which are in turn repaid through property tax increases uh, be above what a baseline is set for the URA. And I think I'm going to close with that and give you guys some time to ask questions. Get my partners up here. Thank you, Virgil. <coughs> and Savannah. Okay, who has questions this morning? <coughs> Thank you. A question for Susan about the uh, Section 8 vouchers. Yes. Do you, is there a time limit for occupancy under Section 8, or is it as long as they meet, meet the criteria? And the second question is, you mentioned porting a voucher to California. Does the city, or, or the latch up that you identified, does that is there an obligation by the city to continue paying into that, or is there no involvement by the city once it's ported? Both very good questions. Um, I'm going to answer the first one, I mean the second one first, and then I'm probably going to have you repeat the, second, the first one. But, but to answer the one about porting, um, it, it's tricky, and these are the rules. They can port anywhere they want to port. Summer, tell me the bedroom size. The lady that just ported to California or is porting to California. One bedroom voucher. So ours was just under 700 is our payment standard. The payment standard in California? $1,500. So the housing authority that she's going to has two options. They can absorb and then, then we get our voucher back. They give her their voucher 
they pay for her. They're choosing, and most housing authorities these days, probably even back when Tim Evers was there, most do not absorb. So they bill. So for as long as that woman continues to meet the criteria and be on the program, we pay that voucher. Our housing authority comes out of our $85,000 a month. And she retains one of our vouchers. The first question had to do with is there, is there a uh, time limit for Section 8? Right. And again, another very good question, no. As long as they continue uh, to meet the criteria, income qualify, um, they can. We do have people who, who we pay zero money for. We call that zero HAP or zero housing assistance payment. And once they're on that, they have six months. Once they have zero HAP payment for six months, then their voucher expires or we take that back. But no, as long as they qualify, they, the voucher is lifetime. Thank you. Sure. Another this would be for Susan. Sunshine Peak Apartments on the bypass is also that tiered tax credit kind of housing. Um, how do they run vacancies on the higher end, like people who have to pay 60% of their income or 80%, and if this new one is going in in um, Colorado Outdoors, will that be in direct competition with Sunshine Peaks? Will the one by City Market be in competition? What about keeping those filled? All of those will, are, you know, we're all serving the same low and very low income population. Um, I did see on the Colorado Outdoors, they're going above the 60%. That is, a, that is a niche market that none of the others fill. I am so happy to see those percentages. Um, those people tend to get ignored and they come in and say, so I'm broke, but I make too much for housing, you know? I mean, that became a double-edged sword for that group. So I'm really happy to see that. But yeah, are they in competition? The, the ones at City Market, we have three or four uh, people at both Barber Court and at Olathe Meadows that have, have asked for to be put on the application wait list. So will we lose those? Yes, but we have 20 or 30 people on both of those wait lists. So I truly do believe that uh, when Chapa issues these, they come in and look. You know, um, for example, Colorado Outdoors, they, they really wanted to do 100 plus units. And we sat down and talked and I said, boy, I, I'm a little concerned at 100 units. And so they, they cut that back to 72. They really listened um, to what I had to say, to what Virgil and Savannah were finding, um, those things. And so um, they're, they marketed, ratcheted that back down to 72 units. Um, I do see that we are all in competition. We have a, an affordable housing list in our office, and that's all the other competition to what we do. We have a, had a meeting uh, the first part of May and sat down, and, and our lists, our wait lists are all two plus years long. We assumed everyone else's wait list was two plus years long. We had a couple vacancies at, uh, at uh, Sunshine Peaks that were reported. We had three or four vacancies at a, a property south of town. We had uh, two at the VOA elderly properties. I got that list all together, sent it to Region 10, Health and Human Services, um, several, Hilltop, several other people that work with, with, with uh, this income group. And, and uh, Hilltop called and said, we play someone this week. This was wonderful. So I just got the weekly Sunshine Peak uh, vacancy and uh, update by the end of by the 10th of june they will be at 100 percent occupied they have remained at 80 97 98 99 percent occupied for the last two or three years so again we're seeing a great need uh, susan yeah how do you handle utilities some landlords pay some utilities and, and it's a very complicated process, and that's why I didn't get into it. Those those uh, market or uh, payment standards that I said that that includes all utilities. So if I said if the payment standard for a, a one bedroom, let's say, was seven hundred, 
That includes about $40 for does it gas and electric, typically. Some of it's a gas heated. Usually, yeah. most units out here are gas. And, and HUD sets all this. We don't go and say, gee, what was, their util what, were, what was their gas bill last month? HUD sets all of that. So if it was $700 and, and they had to pay gas and electric, we have to subtract that $40, and maximum rent can only be $640, $660. Yeah. So just a uh, Virgil, just a point of clarification on your workforce housing. Um, so for five years, the rents are controlled essentially. What ha what happens after? I mean, is that is there a time limit on that so that the, the developers can regain their investment, or how, how does that work? So the uh, typically, in each one of these are done. You know, it, you know, I, I think we have the flexibility moving forward with new workforce housing projects, whether we do them at all or we change the rules. Uh, but for the ones that we've done, have a five-year cap on that uh, uh, rent restrictions. Once that um, goes away, it's not a, a rent control situation. It's not tied to their property. Once it's a contractual obligation, once they've made it through that five years, then they can adjust those rates. Uh, the, the thing that I think is really important with these projects is Without this catalyst of these projects and these incentives to make these projects happen, five years from now we'd be setting with these vacant second floor, um, second floors downtown. Uh, we're going to be seeing new folks moving into downtown, having a vibrant downtown, and also getting folks uh, housed that are wanting to move to Montrose and take part in our um, economy here. Yeah. But <clears throat> fine apartments are not going to be No, they're not. And, and these incentives, I, if, I, if that wasn't clear, I said they're not rent controlled. That rent control is usually tied to the property that runs with the land. This is a contractual uh, uh, obligation that ends in five years. Another question? Virgil, I know your interest in renewable energies and so forth. So any of this new construction, is the city looking at doing any requirements as far as renewables or energy efficiency, anything like that? So the city is uh, our chief building official, um, Archie Byers, is uh, working on some um, proposed code updates to move us to the very latest energy code, residential building code, and International Building Code for Commercial Buildings. Uh, those all have uh, new uh, requirements. Uh, it's not something that it's going to be a big leap for our contractors. Uh, Archie has been working with our contractors to help them improve their technologies. Whenever we can reduce the energy on the consumption in a property, that's a lifelong uh, investment. Sometimes, um, you know, it takes some uh, a mindset that we want to do the right thing for the folks that are buying these houses to do the to to make the energy efficiency uh, measures, put those in place at the very onset. Those really pay greatly in reducing those monthly costs for the life cycle of that building, and so I think that's really critical, and that's the way we're approaching it through the uh, most current energy code, which has uh, talks about um, insulation levels, the tightness of the building, uh, uh, airflow in the building, so forth. Um, you know, I think we've seen a trend throughout the country on, um, on some of these lower income modular projects that are um, potentially replacing mobile home parks where they're putting solar, community solar, into these parks as a way to keep rents low. Uh, rent is not only your principal interest, but it's also your utility cost, as Susan mentioned. And so that's all a component of what someone can afford. And when you get outside of that 30% of your income, uh, then you become cost burden in that house. And by bringing the energy costs down, those utility costs, we can really help those houses a better house, 
at a much affordable price. Thank you very much. And we're at our time limit. Could we please thank these people for